our next fabulous speaker is Melissa Chapman. She is a singer from California, graduate of Boston UMIT with degrees in computational biology. Having done a stint in private industry and at learning houses at MIT and Harvard, Melissa is currently managing director of Ideas Beyond Borders, an organization which is all about promoting free expression and human rights around the world. In an effort to counter extremist narratives and authoritarian institutions. This makes her an ideal person to talk about the erosion of Enlightenment values and why we need to safeguard them. Melissa is a rising star in the secular community and is very well known for putting her milk in before the cereal. So that could come up in the Q&A. Please give a warm welcome to Melissa Chen. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you guys, to the, especially to the organizers, to Mythosos Milwaukee, for inviting me here today. Um, as you can see, uh, today I'll be talking about the Enlightenment, but not the Deepak Chopra kind. Um, I'm going to be talking about the exact polar opposite, so it's the age of reason. Um, so why, why did I choose this topic? Um, why study intellectual history? What, what does looking into 18th century philosophy tell us about the 21st century? Um, the answer is very simple. Ideas. Ideas actually shape human action, and human action shapes human history. Voltaire, who you will hear about more later in this talk, um, said that history should be written as philosophy. And we can track the progress or downfall of entire societies based on looking at the ideas that dominate their culture. So, and we can potentially also discard the ideas that are extremely um, destructive. So let's get on to this. Um, let's, let's first actually talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So, so maybe I overstated the weight. Let's talk about the 105 pound primate in the room. Who the hell am I? Um, that's actually me, not even kidding. Um, the helmet hair is like a passage of right in, uh, for Asian babies. So I was born on um, a little island in Southeast Asia called Singapore. That's actually where it is. Um, you won't really hear about it in the news very much. Um, it's known for being a nanny state with very draconian laws. But life there is extremely comfortable, safe, and very luxurious. Um, but God help you, I mean, ironically, God help you if you are a contrarian. And if you care about abstract civil liberties like the free press, the freedom to protest or assemble, um, then that's not the country for you. Um, I, I had a very conservative Christian upbringing. That's me as an angel in my Sunday school Christmas nativity play. Um, I don't actually have major resting bitch face. That's really just, I'm just upset. <laughs> like, I'm just really upset. That, um, and I think some people are actually born atheists. I was one of those. I never admitted that, though, until much later. So I went to Christian schools my whole life. Um, so my biology classes never really you know, covered all the stuff that contradicts the creation story. So evolutionary biology was totally left out of my education. And it was only after I read um, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins that I fully broke out of the uh, indoctrination and decided to pursue science in college. So. Um, I actually did end up becoming a uh, computational biologist, and I did research in the burgeoning field of um, genomics, published some papers. But on the side, um, I actually became pretty active in secular activism through uh, my friend and now boss, um, Faisal Saeed Al Mutar, who's actually speaking later this afternoon. Um, that was us, I think, just I don't know, a few years ago with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson at one of the atheist conference. Um, so why did I immigrate to the US? Uh, why did I stay on after I went to college and, and graduate school here? Um, I love three things about my life here. The first one is liberal democracy, freedom of speech, and um, science and reason. Um, but here's where we find ourselves at this moment in history. Domestically, you have far left, far right groups threatening liberal, liberalism with a capital L. Um, and worldwide liberal democracy actually appears to be on their decline. You, know, you have 
you know, the Arab Spring failed, ISIS is still running rampant, although they're losing territory, and then you have autocrats in power, um, and, you know, the populists like Viktor Orban, and communism still around, and I don't know what's happening with Kim Jong-un, and Venezuela is like still a shithole. So, it, <laughs> liberal democracy is, you know, it appears to be on the decline. Um, and then by now, you're also aware of the social media um, storm that was brewing around this conference itself, right? The activists have tried to um, cancel it by slandering not just the organizers and the speakers. Um, they've been agitating for local press to cover this. Um, and also getting all the businesses associated, getting the venue and, and tweeting at, at um, Eventbrite to cancel ticket sales and things like that. So, I mean, I'm looking out here and I, I don't see anybody wearing their white robes. Um, you know, this was supposed to be a neo-Nazi training camp or like a, a, a Klan rally, but that's hardly been the case. I mean, we just heard Shu and Head and um, Armored Skeptic, and their message was certainly nothing to do with that. So I'm very confused, right? Um, in America, where free speech is actually enshrined um, in the First Amendment, it really shows you how much it's prioritized. Um, and the problem is that we've been seeing that, that lately free speech is being assaulted in the places that are supposed to be most open-minded to debate, college campuses. So, I mean, yes, I mean, this is something that I, I was worried about. Free speech appears to be also on the decline. Um, the third thing I liked was science and reason. Um, sometime in the last few years, I noticed that the reputation for science as a reliable progenitor of truth was being questioned. Um, curiously, during my time as a researcher, I never actually came across these views. It was only after I left and started getting into secular activism and actually got a Twitter account that I started realizing a lot of people believe this stuff. Um, so science and reason wasn't only undervalued, they were actually being actively assaulted. Um, there was a wholesale assault on them as institutions. So okay, things were really starting to suck. Um, and this is where my interest in the Enlightenment actually comes in. So, what is the Enlightenment? Um, Armit Skeptic actually made a video that's really good. Uh, he actually called the Enlightenment the red pill of the 18th century. And um, I hope in this next few, few minutes that um, I'm going to show you why that is. Um, this painting for me really captures perfectly the hopes, the dreams, the fears of the Enlightenment. Um, it makes you ponder about the changes that humanity faces as a result of developments in science. So it's painted by um, Joseph Wright, and the title of the painting is um, The Experiment on a Bird in the Air Pump. Sounds a little awkward, actually, now that I, mention, I say it out loud. Um, the original can actually be seen um, in the National Gallery in London. And the first thing you'll notice about this painting in general is that it's actually very dark, a group of friends they're gathering in the private house to watch a very dramatic science experiment um, that demonstrates the power of life over death. There's a glass bowl. It's suspended over the table, and in it, a white cockatoo. Um, the valve on the, is on the top of the, of the bowl, and when the glass is sealed and air is pumped out, the bird collapses. It collapses from the lack of oxygen. And that may seem like an obvious fact to us, but it was new knowledge back then um, to many in the mid-18th century. Oxygen wasn't actually pr properly identified until the 1770s. So it was common practice at the time for scientists to travel to private residences to provide evenings entertainment um, to, and instruction to a wealthy family. Here, he is uh, almost indistinguishable from a modern, a modern day magician. I mean, if you look closely, actually, he, I swear to God, he looks exactly like Bill Nye. Uh, <laughs> like the eyebrows and everything. Um, to the left, you'll see a pair of lovers, right? To, to his left. Um, they're, they're sort of enraptured by each other and totally oblivious by the experiment and to the scientific and, and moral implications raised. I, I call them the Kim Kardashian crowd, so they're, they, they're not interested in this stuff. Um, the principal source of light in this entire work of art is, is this candle, and it's hidden behind a glass bowl over there. In the bowl is a pickled skull, and it's a very ominous reminder of uh, the inevitability of death. Sitting in front with their backs turned against our point of view is a father and son parent. They're completely enthralled and focused on this experiment. Um, at the right bottom, you have a philosopher, all the way to the right. He seems deep in thought, troubled, um, perhaps pondering the consequences of this newfound knowledge of um, you know, whether or not science can be used for good or evil. 
To his right, two sisters are in a state of curiosity and also distress, sort of both. Someone's comforting them, reassuring them, and trying to comfort their, their moral anxiety. And in the back, right at the back of the painting, there's, there's this moonlight and looms overhead in, in, the, in the window pane. Um, moonlight, or, or at least the full moon here, is, is a reference to the lunar society that's based in the English Midlands at the time. Um, it was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. They met each month around the time of the late Enlightenment. They, they met to discuss scientific developments and experiments um, during the full moon so that the extra light made the journey home easier and safer in the absence of street lighting. So um, despite the wide range of expressions and reactions to what's going on, every single person here is illuminated by this single source of light. And to me, it suggests that all of them and us are capable of being enlightened by the power of science. So let's step back and, and, and ask ourselves, um, what was the world like before the Enlightenment? Um, absolute monarchy was in play. The king had absolute power over its subjects derived, and he derived that power from God. This is what it means to have divine, divine right. Um, so the king was essentially ordained by God, and monarchy was the natural order of things and they were not subject to laws created by men. The second thing about the pre-enlightenment society was that you kind of stayed in the class in which you were born. There was really no social mobility. If you were born as a peasant or serf, you stayed there pretty much your whole life and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, the medieval justice system was unusually, unusually cruel, very creative, um, and was based on torture, execution, usually in public view. Um, of course, you can imagine if you believe that God gave you your power, justice was hardly going to be justice at all. It's completely predicated on the whims of a narcissistic tyrant. Um, these punishments are not unlike what we're seeing with ISIS today. I mean, if you ever watch their execution videos, they're extremely creative. Drownings, burning in cages, um, beheadings, all sorts of, you know, pushing gay people off the buildings. It's pretty medieval. Um, so. The, the question here is, what is really the Enlightenment, right? The Enlightenment is actually, the word itself is an English translation of um, two, two words that also mean light or related to light. The French word, lumiere, and I'm not even going to try the German word because I'm going to butcher it. Um, light carried a very strong religious connotation. Christ was the light of the world, and we let him into our souls. But if you go back as far as Plato, um, light was also knowledge that we acquire as we leave the caves, uh, whose walls of prejudice and ignorance obscures our vision. So there were by and large a few themes that were extremely, um, that, that underwrites the entire intellectual movements. Here are the themes. So you have reason, the unalien unalienable rights based on natural laws, which forms the basis for um, human rights, by the way. Secularism and freedom of thought and expression. The great Carl Sagan called science a candle in the dark. Um, he titled his book, A Candle in the Dark, illuminating the, um, the demon-haunted world for, for a reason. So the Enlightenment is basically an 18th century movement of, of European thought, and this is exactly what it covered. Um, it wasn't really a centralized movement. It had its thought leaders. The first one, Eng uh, Englishman John Locke, was probably widely regarded as the most influential of them all. He came up with what he thought was the three natural rights of man, um, life, liberty, and property. And that the purpose of government is to actually safeguard these three natural rights of man. The next guy, Montesquieu, this guy was known for promoting this idea of separation of powers. It's a feature of many constitutions, but it's not a feature of the constitution of the country I grew up in, where the judicial and the executive are kind of, um, you know, they're, they're not separated. It's um, no surprise that Montesquieu was actually a lawyer. Voltaire, who you've probably heard of a lot, um, Voltaire, who, the, he has this quote that's often misattributed to him. It's um, that, I, I don't like what you have to say, but I'm going to defend the right, um, the, defend the defend to the death the right for you to say it. Um, but he he promoted this idea of, of uh, separation of church and state, so secularism, and the freedom of speech. Secularism itself was actually the um, entire. I mean, it really affected the French Revolution. And then French 
society is, is based on um, this notion of, of secularism. And, and they defend that actually quite, quite rig rigorously to the point where they don't even allow hijabs or, or things like that in, in public, you know, like public schools or like government. Rousseau um, is the fourth main Enlightenment thinker, and he um, came up with this idea of the social contract. contract. It's an implicit agreement between the government and its subjects. The, the idea is that if the, the three rights, natural rights of um, the Lockean natural rights were violated, one could um, simply overthrow the government. You had a right then because the government did not serve its purpose, that the people had the right to overthrow the government. So the Enlightenment is actually really a historical construction. The main influences um, were the Renaissance, where humanism was really born. The Protestant Reformation, led by Martin Luther, um, which splintered Catholic Europe and the scientific revolution. So yeah, the influences of the Enlightenment actually threefold. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's the Reformation, the Renaissance, and the scientific revolution. Um, the invention, why is it changing? Sorry, the invention of the printing press, um, late 1400s, um, it, it actually impacted the ability of, of ideas to spread far and wide. Um, and and the, the ideas of the Enlightenment were so powerful that it actually set off revolutions. 1776, you had the American Revolution, and a few years later, the, the French Revolution. The ideas of um, the Enlightenment thinkers were also enshrined in our US Constitution. And Th Thomas Jefferson utilized the um, uh, natural rights of, of, of that Locke wrote about. And you can find it in the Declaration of Independence, you know, that, that humans are born with unalienable rights or inalienable rights um, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was directly uh, lifting from, from the um, Constitution. So while the American and the French revolutions actually encouraged political change, an economic revolution was also occurring simultaneously. Um, Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, invented this notion of free markets. And the effect of the Industrial Revolution brought fundamental changes to the way goods were made. Introduced mass production, the factory system, steam power, and it linked science to the development of technology and lifted hordes of humanity out of poverty, continuing on a trend that Steven Pinker describes very well in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, which happened in the uh, 1990s, and the end of the Cold War, it seemed that capitalism and liberal democracy won out. This prompted Francis Fukuyama to write a book called The End of History, in which he claimed that we had reached the end point of man's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of government. He wrote this book, he, it actually started out as an essay and it became a book in 1992. We're now in the 21st century and, and that theory seems to have fallen completely flat on his face. It kind of reminds me of Thomas Watson who was the president of IBM who in 1943 actually said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, yeah, that's wrong, of, outright wrong. So, you know, the question that we have to ask ourselves is the same question that Hillary Clinton had to ask in, late, in her latest book, what happened? Like, why was Francis Fukuyama so wrong? I, so I looked into this issue, I you know, was really curious about why the Enlightenment project appears to have stalled, um, and came up with several reasons. The first one is, I call it the dark side of the Enlightenment. So baked into the Enlightenment itself is almost its recipe for, or its path to, to, to be to the downfall. The second one is really bad PR, and hopefully we can defend that. The third one, um, I like to call it the grand unified theory of why everything sucks, and it's postmodernism. Um, and the fourth one is that there are actually alternatives that are competing against, against um, enlightenment values. You have systems like illiberal democracy now, like China, which, you know, it's like a Marxist capitalist state, but it still retains its political controls. Um, and then you have theocracy, which still has a stronghold on certain parts of the world, like especially the Middle East. Um, and then you have number five, which is loss of support for Enlightenment ideals. Now let's go into the dark side of the Enlightenment. Um, one of the first issues is that I think there was a lot of hubris, right? Like we, there was overwhelming faith in, in the power of reason. 
modern psychology shows that reason is far less powerful than it once was once thought to be. Our mind, like we thought that, that, that reason was something like, especially Kant, someone like Kant thought that, I've got to say that word very carefully, I don't know how British people say it, um, but Immanuel Kant, he, he believed that reason was something that all humans were innately capable of. But modern psychology is showing us a very different result. Um, the mind is actually divided, and, and the metaphor here is actually on the right. It's a rider riding on an elephant, and the rider's job is to actually serve the elephant without having much, of, you know, you don't really have that much control of where the elephant's gonna go simply by sheer difference of, of, of size. So you can direct it somewhat, you can motivate it, you can shape its path, but Otherwise, you have not that much control. It's not full control. So the idea is that system one, which is the elephant, is your intuition. And the rider who's trying to direct the intuition is your reasoning capabilities. The um, rational thinking is actually very, so, so system one is your rational, uh, is, is not, sorry, it's the intuitive part of your, of, your, of your cognitive circuits. And system two is actually where you, you start to rationalize and reason. What this means is that the sequence of steps that go through in order to arrive at the same conclusion, what it means to be rational is that, is that those steps can be articulated. So with intuitions, we can usually state what our final judgment is, but, but most of the time we can't really articulate how we got there. Um, the second feature of rational thought, which is the system two, so the elephant thought, is universality. Universality, sorry. Reasons are actually good for one person are presumptively valid for all persons. The idea that our minds have very different parts, partially redundant and often conflicting, is one of the most um, troubling claims in the history of philosophical reflection on the nature of, of thought. Um, according to the dual process view, we have two styles of cognition, and they have very different features. Um, so the elephant, which is system one, is, is your autopilot, it's your intuition, it's when you, um, go to catch a ball, like a, a fly ball, you know exactly where to position yourself. And these are, these are calculations you're making in your head, you don't even know what they are, but you just get there somehow. I mean, some of us do. But system two is, is deep, rational thought, and it takes time, it's very slow. This was the result of work by um, two behavioral economists from, from Princeton, Daniel Kahneman, I can't remember the other guy's name. Um, and what it showed was that the pre-enlightenment assumptions that, that reason was something that, that was dominant and that all humans had to do was just focus on it was actually kind of flawed. We, we did not expect intuition to actually play such a big role. Um, the second dark side of the enlightenment was that I think it focused way too much on individuality. Um, it, it completely ignored man as, as a social animal. Jonathan Haidt, who, pub, who wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, he, um, he posited that human nature is 90% chimpanzee and 10% honeybee. So one of the things that the honeybee can do is it makes these beautiful structures. It lives in these big you know, uh, societies and it builds a hive. And these are things that one honeybee cannot do. So it's cooperation on a level that's just you know, supersized. Um, super organisms like the hive mind, they're able to achieve feats of grandeur. I mean, think of like the architecture that, that of, of churches back in the day, right? So the emphasis of reason and over tradition actually cut huge numbers of people loose from their social and cultural moorings. And it led to a bit of a spiritual anxiety and exis existentialism or nihilism. So, I mean, questions like what is the meaning of life, right? Obviously, I mean, all of us woke ones know it's 42, but for, for, the, for the average person for whom religion isn't any more of a, of a feature in their lives, I mean, the Enlightenment values haven't, there hasn't been any cohesive effort to, to answer that question. I'm, I, I kind of dispute this 90, 10% thing, um, but one thing that I think that humans all have is this desire, the desire to transcend self-interest and let something larger um, than ourselves actually consume us. And, and the question that the enlightenment, enlightenment sort of thought needs to answer is, what is that? Like, what is this thing that's going to, to bind us? Um, the third thing, the third reason that the enlightenment project has stalled is bad PR. 
It has been accused of, of having its hand in almost every baleful moment of, of human history. It's been indicted as the destroyer of morality, the harbinger of selfish individualism, robbing human life of meaning, and, and even being a form of cultural imperialism. And it's been directly, apparently directly responsible for all these things that you see here. Slavery, colonialism, global warming, and the Holocaust. So here's my answer to these people who assail the Enlightenment for, for, for these wrongdoings. Slavery, all right? So from the earliest periods of recorded history, slavery was actually found in, in the most advanced regions. So this was pre-Enlightenment. Remember, the Enlightenment happened in, in the 17th century. The earliest civilizations, so we're talking about Mesopotamia, the Nile in Egypt, the Egyptian uh, civilization, all of them had slavery. The earliest known system of law, the Hammurabi Code, um, it actually recognized slavery. And the true first slave society in history emerged in ancient Greece be between the sixth and the fourth centuries. Um, so during the classical period, this was something that was almost a feature of mankind. And to pin this on the Enlightenment and say that, I mean, surely the Enlightenment brought along scientific progress that enabled slavery to spread faster because we, we built these big boats and we could sail to the Americas and their whole slave trade became much larger than it would have been. But, but to say that we could pin slavery on the Enlightenment was, is, is a little far-fetched. Colonialism. Um, I'm from a country that was uh, a, a former colony of um, the motherland, the United Kingdom. And the reason I'm only speaking English right now and not Mandarin to you is actually because of colonialism. Um, colonialism itself also predates the Enlightenment. Um, Alexander the Great, the, um, the Mongols. You have the Muslim conquest of Muhammad trying to spread his caliphate. Colonialism is not something like slavery. It's not something that was merely invented in the Enlightenment, but scientific progress sped up or improved its capacity to reach more corners of the world. The third thing blamed on enlightenment is global warming. Um, and I acknowledge that climate change is something that, that is a huge challenge to you know, market-based economics, simply because it's a collective action problem, and that's exactly what a market failure is. But that doesn't mean we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, you know, the enlightenment and, and progress also lifted millions of people out of poverty into freedom. And to, to say that, oh, because of this one issue, global warming, you know, all of, all of it is bad, is merely throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, the fourth thing, this one baffles me. Um, Holocaust, I hear so many people say Nazism, Holocaust, these are direct, direct uh, you know, impact of, of the Enlightenment. This couldn't be more wrong. Um, obviously, because if you actually read the tenets of, of Enlightenment thought, none of it, there's no direct line. It's not, like, it's not like when somebody says, like, Allahu Akbar, and they blow themselves up. That's actually a direct line between what, what they were taught and their action. In the case of the Holocaust, that's not, um, there's, there's no direct line at all between any Enlightenment thought and this idea that, that of, of subjugating and murdering people. And Lyman thought was all about um, tolerance, actually, and, and secularism, as you've seen before from the thinkers. Um, this actually was, was a piece, like somebody actually went on Fox News and said that the Enlightenment was the reason, you know, that, that the Holocaust actually existed. And nobody actually pushed back. Um, okay, so the next topic is postmodernism. Um, it was hard to really put on paper what postmodernism was, but I thought this was a really useful um, graphic. I went to this like, art museum once in Vancouver, and, and it, it had this, like, it was a postmodernist art exhibit, and there was a banner on, on, the, on the front of the museum, and it said, art is everything and anything and nothing. So it's like this statement. I'm like, so art is like racism now, right? Like racism is everything and anything and nothing at the same time. Um, so what is postmodernism? It, it seems to be, it, it's, it's actually a term, it's an intellectual movement that encompasses many different fields. It's not just, it's not just philosophy, it's, it's not just something that infected academia. I mean, there's actually good aspects of postmodernism. I think postmodernism really came out from a, a tradition of skepticism, extreme skepticism. It was a direct um, sort of a reactionary movement that happened, especially after the shock of the horrors of World War II. 
started questioning scientism and scientific-based racism and all that stuff. So it had, I guess, pretty benign intentions, but, but the problem with its tenets was that the logical conclusions of postmodernism turned out to be extremely harmful for us right now. Um, in architecture, you could say that postmodernism was an okay thing, um, if you like modern architecture. Um, in art and film, you have things like, I mean, trust me, in art, there's some really bad art out there. Um, and and postmodernism is, you know, was sort of the, the, the icon of it was uh, Duchamp had this uh, urinal, literally just a white urinal that he displayed as art. So the, the avant-garde, um, surrealist crap that you see in a lot of contemporary museums that everyone has to pretend to like is basically postmodernist art. Um, in terms of film, you have like something like The Matrix, right? Everything was, reality was, was not real. It was just a social construction that's directly out of the postmodernist textbook, and that's a really great film. So my issue with postmodernism is that it's a complete rejection of the Enlightenment project and the foundational assumptions upon which it was built. There is absolute, absolutely no truth, you know, which to me is a very strange claim because the, the claim of postmodernism, that there is no absolute truth, is itself a claim of truth that is absolutist. So it almost ref refutes itself. It's kind of like when Obi-Wan Kenobi said that only a Sith deals in absolutes. He just declared himself to be a Sith, right? So postmodernism is self-refuting. Self the problem, so these are the arguments. Modernism is really a direct result of enlightened thought. And here, I've contrasted it with views of um, the postmodernist way of thinking. So the problem, my main problem with postmodern, postmodern theory is simply that there is no universal truth. And in that light, how can anyone objectively criticize human acts such as Holocaust, slavery, forced female genital mutilation, um, it, it, it's impossible because if there's no standard upon which you have to basically throw the whole textbook on universal human rights out, right? Um, we should actually care because postmodernism, I think as the other guys have sort of talked about before, is, has somewhat corrupted higher education. And not just higher education, it's corrupted politics, our social discourse, even law. So, you know, um, consider what might be the effect on college students' view of the world when the following propositions are taught to them as true. There's no objective truth. All knowledge is relative to language systems and power. There are, there are no universal values shared by human beings. There's no predetermined human nature. So, so for example, like a lot of people nowadays would actually deny that there are such a thing as differences between gender and that all differences are just some sort of social construct, which is, I mean, my background's in biology. We actually have different chromosomes. Um, the result of all these teachings would be extremely pernicious. And indeed, they have been the basis of wholesale assault on Western principles of justice and liberty. Um, so, you know, th these are some of the arguments that are almost like a direct result of, of postmodernist way of thinking. It spawned critical theory, identity politics. One of them is all cultures are equally valid. Um, who are we to criticize, uh, you know, those poor women who, who, are, in, who, who are forced to wear burqas and, and cover up for, like, that is their culture. Who are we to, to, to question or, or, or um, criticize that? And then you have this weird thing that, that happened, I don't know, in the last six years. I have no idea how long it's been around for, but this idea that racism is prejudice plus power. Um, if you look up the textbook definition of racism, that's not what it's always been. It seems to have been supplanted by this new definition. Um, so the end result of this, obviously, is that the idea that if you are a person of color, and technically I'm one, I can't be racist. I, f I actually physically can't be racist, which is obviously that's completely bollocks. Um, I mean, it descended to the point where poor Justin Trudeau has been called a, a white supremacist. I mean, Justin Trudeau, the guy who has been so sympathetic to Syrian refugees and opened this country up, and I mean, you couldn't find, I mean, the, a bigger heart of a liberal almost in Justin Trudeau, and he's a white supremacist now. So when they call Sargon of Akkad white supremacist, he's basically Justin Trudeau. They're all basically the same. 
the language that emanates you know, from, from a lot of these people who embrace this kind of thought, they, they, they're the kind of people that attack I'm a, I'm a skeptic and Shu, my secular activist friends Faisal and, and Ali Rizvi, who, who are ex-Muslim um, uh, reformers. The, the, end, the, the simple logical end game of a school of philosophy, which regardless of the problem it seeks to answer, has found, the, has found in its answer that everything is the fault of the racist, capitalistic, patriarchal West. Everything in the world now to, to these people is, is a problem that's caused by a combination or a combination thereof, Western civilization, colonialism, capitalism, racial supremacy, or even worse, Zionism. Um, one, of the, um, one of the issues with, with, with this logical extension is that now the Enlightenment values is seen to be, uh, because it was a movement that came out of Western civilization, Western civilization seem to be white. Therefore, championing Enlightenment thought is white supremacy, which is racism. My issue with that is, um, this is the horseshoe theory. I mean, you can see some similarities between the far left and the far right in terms of their um, identitarian nature, their, their um, love of, I guess, political violence. Um, to the far left, America will never be great because of racism. And to the far right, America will only be great if we return to racism. So the problem is that if we accept the conflation of Western civilization as white nationalism or liberalism as the West, then we're really gonna expand um, the scope of the term alt-right such that it loses all its meaning. So people that stand for enlightenment values, nowadays the popular term is classical liberals, are now known as racists, um, alt-righters. That's why, you know, Somebody like Sargon, who is a classical liberal, or Dave Rubin, is, is known as an alt-writer, which is completely ridiculous. Um, so <laughs> this stuff actually happens. Uh, when, when Boston recently had the, the free speech, um, I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. Like the, This idea of anyone that's going to embrace Enlightenment values is, is now already a, a neo-Nazi. So the people who are basically advocating for, for you know, the, the right of, of people to punch Nazis, like classical liberals, if you hold enlightenment values now, you are a Nazi. Um, so the fourth issue with why the Enlightenment Project stalled is that there has been um, an, a, an alternative model that emerged. Um, one of them is called liberal democracy. So liberalism has been on the rise around the world. Um, Every single freedom indicator in the last 10 years has actually declined. Um, I find this very sad. <laughs> and, you know, this is just some data that shows that global democracy is also a liberal... Liberalism and democracy are two different things, right? Liberalism is, is more of a, an issue of uh, civil liberties. You know, how free are people to do, do the things that they're entitled to? Democracy is just one person, one vote, and, and that people vote their government in. So you saw the previous slide, illiberalism is actually on the rise. And now this is the democracy index. It looks like in the last 10 years, democracy is on the decline. Um, so while in the past years, the declines in freedom were generally concentrated among um, autocracies and dictatorships that simply went from bad to worse. In 2016, the, the scary trend is that it was actually established democracies countries that were used to be rated free um, that are sliding back. So, so free countries are now accounting for a larger share of the countries with declines than at any, any time in the past decade. And nearly one quarter of those countries registering declines in freedom actually come from Europe. So we're looking at countries like Hungary. Um, so here, here is the, the top countries that have seen 10-year declines. These, this is from a Freedom House that actually every year puts out this report um, trying to rate, trying to track the um, liberal democracies. It's, it's a liberal democracy index. Um, and you can see a lot of these countries are, are troubling. Like Turkey has had the, the biggest uh, decline of any other country and it's considered a European country. So what is a liberal democracy exactly? Um, Basically, they have the trappings of democracy, voting, fair elections, 
just without the full array of civil liberties. Um, it's actually a growth industry. Seven years ago, only 22% of de democratizing countries could, could be said to be categorized as such. Five years ago, it became 35%. Um, and to date, very few illiberal democracies have actually matured into liberal democracies. If anything, they're moving in the opposite direction. They're, they're sort of staying illiberal and getting more illiberal. So classic examples of liberal democracies in the United States, I mean, most of you know, Scandinavia, Europe, Australia. And you have illiberal democracies like Russia, Turkey is a very textbook case now, and my home country of Singapore where we do vote for the government but we don't vote for our president, that was recent. Um, and, but you also don't have these uh, you know, luxuries of, of freedom of speech. The liberal autocracy, that's a unicorn because you can't really have high civil liberties, but I mean, it's rare to really find a place that, that guarantees uh, civil liberties for people, but you can't vote for the government. I mean, this is why democracy is a path to liberalism, right? Um, and autocracy, the classic example is uh, Saddam Hussein, who my friend Faisal looks exactly alike. That's where he's from, he's from Iraq. Um, <laughs> so um, here, and the, the fifth problem also with the Enlightenment is why it's stalling is that it's actually losing support. And this is very troubling. It's like, you know, in tsunami systems now, or like earthquake systems, they're, they're developing these early tsunami warning systems. And I think one of the early warning systems that democracy isn't really, you know, it's on the, it's on the decline, is that it's actually losing support. So people, I mean, from all these countries that are benefiting from it in the West, young people no longer support the idea of democracy. That's not something that actually they care about, and that's a problem. And then you have this issue. Um, just this year alone, um, even last year, you've had like, issues like um, the Middlebury College protests, um, Berkeley, especially Berkeley, which is like on fire every now and then because somebody they don't like is speaking there. Um, or, or Evergreen State University where Brett Weinstein, a professor, was you know, basically uh, forced to, uh, he, well, he, he resigned and actually won a huge settlement against the university, but these trends are not isolated. They're, they, they seem to be happening far more frequently. I mean, nearly half of the millennials actually polled in a recent, this was done by University of Chicago. It says that um, they asked, should colleges limit the freedom of speech in extreme cases? So what is extreme cases? It was actually slurs, racial slurs, or any, any other slur, um, or other intentionally offensive language and costumes that stereotype certain racial and ethnic groups. So costume. So basically, if you wore an Indian outfit or a taco outfit, you could be one of those who millennials actually support restricting the free speech of. Um, so, you know, my question is, can we actually turn the tide? The reason why I thought it was important to, to identify, you know, what's stalling the Enlightenment project is so that we can answer, can we save it? because I think it's worth saving, and I immigrated here because I thought, I thought this was the place that, that, I would, I would, you know, that I would be able to experience the full panoply of a liberal democracy. Um, in order to really assess the prospects of a, a new enlightenment, or at least saving the last one, I think we need to understand more clearly the strengths and weakness of our system two thinking. Um, great thinkers of the enlightenment, they completely dismiss system one, they completely dismiss intuition. Um, and they treated it as not only non-existent, but also inferior to reason. That is their hubris, and we know better. We can't really work against human nature. We've got to always work with it. It, it, makes things, it makes achieving goals so much easier. So in light of the new findings, we also have to account for it and not work against it. The communal aspect of religion, right? That's the second thing. Communal aspect of religion is also a strength. And, um, you know, on one hand, it creates a transcendent community. Um, on the other hand, it's basically tribalism writ large. It, it, it sort of drives this, like, wedge between in-group and out-group. Um, but we, what we do need to figure out is that religions actually do something well. It reminds us, they, they, they sort of form this, like, shared um, space, shared humanity across races and geographical boundaries. Can there be an enlightenment or a secular version of that in which we can 
sort of extract the benefits of, of having a, a communal, you know, um, the communal benefits of, of religion, but without all the crap that comes along with it. Um, the third one is we need to actually improve the PR of the Enlightenment. It is bad out there. And that's partly what I hope all the guys here, all the YouTubers that were invited, I and mean, that's, that's one of the things they're doing. Hosts like Dave Rubin, you know, Sam Harris. These are guys that are actually um, pushing back on this West is white nonsense, right? Uh, we can no longer deny um, Western countries, I think, the civic nationalism. There's a very big difference between civic nationalism and ethnic nationalism. Ethnic nationalism is, you know, um, the desire to keep America white. But civic nationalism is the idea of institutions that are, are formed from Enlightenment values. And that we cannot be ashamed of those values because what happens when America is ashamed of those values to countries like the ones I grew up in, where now you know, authoritarian governments can say, aha, you see, like, even the West doesn't defend those, those systems anymore. Why should we? Why should we even go there? Um, the failure also of extremely responsible actors to address widely held concerns about things like borders and, and you know, sovereignty non-assimilation of some communities, um, it really helped a lot of ex more extreme political actors fill that vacuum. If we conflate every single iteration of, um, of nationalism with racism, it's completely counterproductive to the Enlightenment project. We must defend the Western tradition, but not let the term Western turn into a slur. And that's almost the, the, the brilliance of, of a lot of the uh, social justice movement. Thank you. Um, and, and postmodernism needs to be reputed from the inside, from within the heart of the academies. Um, it presents a threat not only to liberal democracy, but to modernity itself. Um, I mean, you can see how politics is becoming far more irrational and identitarian. It's very, very unnerving. I mean, we can, leave, we, we can you know, retain the postmodernist film and everything. I think the art, I mean, in my opinion alone, the art needs to go. Um, <laughs> the next thing, defend liberty. Liberalism is defined by the com a commitment to li liberty. And at root, it is a concept that is grounded on the individual. The problem is that there are movements now that want to grant rights to groups instead of individuals. That's what Nazism is, communism is, um, you know, Antifa wants to do that. Uh, it's also the goal of, of ISIS. It's the infidels and the non-infidels. So it's, it's group-based politics. Um, it's... Um, at, it is the freedom of, of to be all that one is, to actually actualize the fullness of your potential as a human being endowed with the capacity for self-actualization, right? And we want to uphold that. Instead of encouraging us to rest easy in the assurance that liberalism will certainly triumph, um, a conception of liberty based on human dignity recognizes that there is nothing inevitable about its, its success. While each of us may wish to be free as an individual, it shows that individual freedom is dependent on us and all of us being free. And that means that we need to find some form of shared humanity. Um, the, the next one is to be completely cognizant of all the illiberal forces. I sort of talked about a few already. Um, and the last one, which is very depressing, is, is the millennials. Like we have to focus on making sure that the younger people are actually valuing enlightenment values and they don't fall prey to the kind of postmodernist thought that's infecting the academia right now. So, I mean, my conclusion, you know, it's the state of the Enlightenment right now. It's, it's a little depressing, but, you know, I don't think it's dead. I don't think freedom is dead. It's just being tested. Um, and, and that, you know, one of, the, one of the things that is a direct consequence of living in a free society is that we have to be completely uh, vigilant at all times. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stay up here for a second. All right, everyone. Whoa. I am much louder than Melissa. Right. <laughs> okay, so we are at our first lunch break. So we're going to do this uh, because we feel like it's kind of important to do a Q&A. So we're going to simultaneously break you for lunch. And whoever wants to go, please. And then for those that want to stay and listen to some Q&A with Melissa, then we'll, we'll do a few minutes of that. So the quick announcement regarding lunch before y'all leave uh, is that you're in the heart of downtown. 
It's pretty awesome. There's a lot of places around here. If you're an out-of-towner, I would buddy up with someone who knows the local establishments. Um, I would say one of my favorite places is right across the street. It's kind of hard to find. It's called the Safe House, but their wait at lunch is insane. So I highly recommend you guys go there. It's, it's like a museum. It's one of the top attractions in Milwaukee, but that might be a better place to save for dinner. Um, otherwise, have fun and we'll do a Q&A. So again, the lineup is right there. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. I, I can hear you. Welcome to uh, Milwaukee. Mm. Um, Thank you, my first time in Wisconsin. Yeah. Ben Shapiro recently talked about that system one, system two thing you were talking about. Yeah. Describing how, how Andrew Breitbart, Breitbart talked about how system one would be like culture and system two would be politics and that politics are downstream from culture. And so that if you want to change what people are doing politically or through policy, what you got to do is change the culture first. Yeah. And so I guess my main concern is when we, when we talk about how enlightenment's dying and stuff, is that when we're driving people away from churches and tradition and stuff like that, that we might actually be eroding the culture that it's founded on, and then we create a vacuum that people fill with things like radical identity politics, feminism, stuff like that. Yeah. Do you think we gotta try to get that filled with enlightenment? Do we need like Captain America cartoons or something? I mean, there, there's, there's good tribalism and bad. Like one, one good example is sports, right? Um, nobody's ever killed, I mean, I've never seen a Bucks fan kill a you know, Thunders fan, but that's, that's good tribalism. And, and, the, and that's a common shared space, a cultural space. So I think that's, that's why people were so pissed recently when, when you had the, all these players kneeling in protest at the NFL because a lot of people, for a lot of people, they felt that this was one area, one cultural area in America that, that sort of like, it was our common space, right? And now all these people were bringing politics into it, right? They were bringing their system two stuff into the system one stuff. And, and, and it was shredding a bit of that, that commonality. So while I support the right to protest and everything, it's one thing to consider. I think you're right that, and I think Ben is right in that respect, that um, it's, we need to find these spaces because if we lose them or if we lose this, and, and that's, that's why this Enlightenment Project is so important, it's because if we don't rally around what makes the West great, the problem is that we have, in, in a system like Enlightenment system where, where it's focused so much on individualism, I mean, we, you won't defend the project if you're not bound by it by other people. So I think that's a completely legitimate um, analysis of, of culture and politics. It's actually quite interesting. I, didn't, I, I never heard about that, but I can see the argument. Thanks. Welcome. Hello, Melissa. Hi. <laughs> um, so I actually was going to talk about the... Oh, uh, hi! Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know Melissa. Sorry, guys. Um, so I was going to actually talk about this, uh, this whole system one, system two. Actually, it's the elephant and the writer, Jonathan. Yeah. Tate, and, I think it's a um, useful analogy. Yeah, it is. And, um, well, it also speaks to uh, a myth that you've identified in the Enlightenment, was baked in the Enlightenment. You yeah. have the others, like Stephen Pinker mentions the blank slate and the... Yeah. Noble Savage and all those things, but the, this reason thing is kind of a new development because uh, cognitive psychology has done a lot of research in it recently. And to yeah. summarize for everyone, I mean, the, 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 the enigma, in fact, there's a book called The Enigma of Reason, is that we tend to think that, that reason always leads to truth and that we, our human reasoning capacity was developed for truth, but yeah. cognitive psychology is now starting to discover that, in fact, um, reason was developed to allow us to manipulate our environment and not necessarily get to truth. Right. So my, my question then is, if we're really interested in getting to truth, and especially if we're talking about um, politics, then we're looking at moral philosophy, and it gets a little bit murky and gray, and people do start to argue for their tribes rather than for a moral truth. So my question is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna criticize the format of this forum. Um, is it really a good idea then to only take the people who are the most popular on YouTube and put them on a platform. Um, that's actually they, they already have a platform. Well, yes. And but, their platform, but frankly, this is bigger. This, this organization here is, we, I, I understand we have the goal of finding mm -hmm. moral truth, right? Yeah. So does Richard Dawkins then, is he against free speech when he says he won't debate creationists? 
No, I don't think he's right. well, against. He, well, speech. there's a reason for that, though. I mean, and the question is, community and institutional censorship based on good faith actors, is that a bad thing? Considering what we know about moral reasoning. Well, see, in Richard Dawkins' case, um, he wasn't, I mean, nobody invited him and then resigned it, right? Nobody canceled the, the event. So he, he just said outright he won't waste time in debates. No, no but he has been invited to debates where he wasn't given the list of people going. And when he found out that a certain person was going, he wouldn't go because he would refuse to give them that platform. Right, and that's freedom of association. Well, sure, sure. And Absolutely. That's, my, that's my question to you is that if we as a community want to get at moral truths, shouldn't we censor ourselves based on is this a good faith actor or not? I, I mean, that's reasonable. I think there are absolutely bad faith actors. Okay. Um, All right, I'm being told to go, so <laughs> I'll see you. I'll uh, see you tonight. Okay. Well played again. <laughs> so, hi. hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm always well, actually. Thank really? you. Indeed. I want what you have. So, I wanted to mention you criticizing, or I mean, I wanted to mention Scientism, actually, and Marcel yeah. Duchamp and uh, Fountain, even though you only spoke in them momentarily. So, I wanted to ask you again about science and the, uh, the wholesale implementation of science and people following science as the sole form of uh, what, logic or faith and reason, and how subjective reason actually is. For example, if for if, um, if, logic, if logic and reason were to dictate that something or a method were to be inhumane or uh, otherwise cruel, but very extremely practical, mm -hmm. would it still be the most reasonable or logical decision to make? I'm not sure that that would actually be the case because logic is, again, subjective. As, uh, piggybacking on what my predecessor said, you know, logic was constructed to formulate, or was formulated to construct, or help us construct our environment and enhance our environment for us. So when that, I, well, sorry, I think I think I'm not good at this, but um, I know I understand what your point is. Yeah, no, I I think that um, there's a huge distinction between values and facts, and science um, cannot really inform us on what that value is. Yes, it has been abused. I mean, you know, we've developed weapons and. But it wasn't science that decided to drop the weapon, like to drop the bomb on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Well, isn't it to say then that science is just easily capable of manipulating people as religion? I wouldn't say that. I mean, I don't think it's, well, a lot of religion uses scientific advancements to conduct their wars as well. Well, they use, well, it's not necessarily that they use the scientific advancements to conduct their wars, but they use the religious principle to Correct. facilitate people yeah. into participating in yeah. the war. And, so and, isn't and, it possible that science can be used in the same way? But, but what, what is science? I mean, that, that comes down to that question. Like, what, what is at the heart of science? I mean, it, it is, to me, as a practicing scientist for, you know, almost eight years, um, it was merely a, a method. It was just a method of knowing. It's a way of knowing. And that, well, that isn't was the it. same for religion, then? It, well, yes, certainly an invalid way of knowing, because you don't really know. But well, and technically in science, you also wouldn't really know, seeing as there's a lot that science can't actually No, absolutely, absolutely. But I don't think science... Well, I, uh, please, if before this guy kicks me off, I'd like to say my <laughs> okay. last thing, if sure. possible. So uh, Marcel Deschamps Fountain, the guy who also holds my uh, name, is ironically you know, uh, stating that the urinal itself is a construction that is, dispenses water. It's a thing that dispenses clean water. It's like, uh, you know, he's noting on how ironic it is on how marvelous this contraption is, but it's also, you know, constructed logically as being a thing that is dirty or yeah. unclean, even yeah. though that, you know, it is what it is. Marcel Duchamp was actually, you know, an international, like, chess player. He was a master logician, and he actually composed Fountain as an ironic interpretation on the subjective nature of logic. What's so, the, What's the question? I, that was, yeah. No, no, I, there, I there's deep question. stuff about no, yeah, Pilsman's art. <laughs> One question, everyone. Don't need narratives. Don't need life stories. One question. Okay. I don't mind hearing it. Thank you for attending. It's. Uh, I really liked your lecture. I agreed with a lot of the points you made. Thank you. Um, Sorry for the technical issues. Yep. It's all good. Um, my question. I'm going to ask you a question. I just want your base response to it. Um, okay. I believe 
postmodernism was given birth because of atomic warfare in the Cold War. Like you look at this theater, for example, this is an example of modernism. There's this ornate structure that's built, a lot of work went into it, beautiful place, right? More like neoclassicalism. Sure, thing. sure. But the idea is you drop a 10 megaton nuclear weapon on this, the whole thing's destroyed. Mm -hmm. So the idea of postmodernism was, my belief, created because of atomic warfare. The idea that what's the point of any of this if we're all going to nuke each other? You look at North Korea, what's going on with America, North Korea, there's this, I believe that the only way to truly get over postmodernism is to come over, overcome the fear of nuclear weaponry. Do you agree with that assertion? Do you think it's a little bit of simplification? I don't know. I, I have a, a parallel theory to why postmodernism was really, like, gained the currency that it did. Mm -hmm. So socialism has been on the rise since the late 1800s, right? So right. Early 1900s. Right. There was a crisis of failure in this in this movement around the 60s and 70s when you know the Red Scare and everything and right. America was trying to purge you know communist belief and, and ideas from the right. world. So, and and also the horrors that were coming out of Stalin's you know, Russia and, and and Mao's China. Sure. It it was pretty apparent morally that there were some issues with the implementation of socialism. Right. So. Postmodernism, in a way. So, if you were losing the argument on logic as a socialist, right? What you needed to do was then to destruct the idea of logic to sustain it, and that's why every single postmodernist I know also is a socialist. Right. So, for me, like the reason I, I think that actually the reason why so, uh, postmodernism is so you know in vogue these days is actually one of the progenitors is, is actually because it, socialism had to embrace it to survive. I agree, yeah. So, I, I, it's an interesting proposition, though. I, I'll have to think about that a bit more, like the nuclear weapons issue. Thank you. Two more questions, two more, and then we're going to shut it down. Okay, guys, sorry. Okay. I'll be I'll, around, so... Yeah, Melissa's going to be around, talk to her VIP party, all that stuff. I'll make this nice and quick, but, uh, again, love the show. That was absolutely excellent. Thank you. But, uh, as a very... As a liberal who is very pro-democracy, very pro-science, um, currently studying on a campus to be a scientist myself. Oh, really? Yep, a uh, physicist. Oh, nice. But, the real uh, science. <laughs> so they say. <laughs> but um, what can I do to sort of, per se, knock some sense into some of my peers' heads? <laughs> or just, what can I do, like, should I go out on the streets on... Uh, free speech day with signs and just telling people the good things about free speech and science or are there better approaches? I mean, do you find that on campus it's a problem? Like, is there like um, well, sort of censorship ag issues? Or? Ag again, to be quick, uh, I'm, I go to North Dakota State University, so it's a okay. pretty red state. There's not a whole lot of issues with that around there, but it's kind of starting to grow. Okay. Um, on campus, I mean, you have organizations that focus on free speech on campus, like FIRE, have you heard of them? FIRE? I think so. Yeah, so, I mean, there are organizations that have, like, local chapters and everything. Um, a lot of the, the, the movement, like, how they get organized to shut down events, it's, it's all through student groups, so you'll just have to somehow find a student group or form one that, that's sort of opposing them. And, and if you get in touch with FIRE, you can start like a, your own student group on campus that's focused on free speech if it doesn't exist, or at least defending it. And you know what's really helpful is the organizers of this conference has realized, if you can tape, if you can just find a video of people trying to shut down other people's speech, like the online mob outrage you could harness to direct against them is actually pretty huge. Like people get very angry with, with seeing like, other people trying to shut down events and things like that, which is great. Actually, that's actually one of the saving graces of this entire movement is actually how, how many people are standing against it. And, and somehow those images that come out, it, it makes it to the New York Times eventually. Like, you know, I was happy that the New York Times started reporting on what happened to Charles Murray at, um, at Middlebury College because you know when the New York Times is reporting about it, it's, it's mainstream. These ideas that there's a decline in free speech it's not some like, you know, like Breitbart news crap. Like this is, it's actually happening and it may change the conversation. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, when you, 
Oh, sorry. When you were uh, talking about the Enlightenment values, you kept making reference to Kant. And... <laughs> I hate saying that word. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've read uh, Stephen, Hick, uh, Stephen Hicks' uh, yeah. Explaining Postmodernism, and he describes Kant not as a father of the Enlightenment, but actually more of a father of postmodernism because he's very anti-Enlightenment. Why yeah. do you... Why do you view Kant as a father of the Enlightenment? I know, I, he's, he's late. Uh, so, so even someone like Rousseau, by the way, I didn't mention this in my talk, but he's kind of controversial because he's, he is considered an Enlightenment thinker, but I actually think if you really get down deep into his works, he's actually the father of the counter-Enlightenment. Um, his ideas were, were used by Stalin, mm -hmm. Pol Pot, to, and, and Robespierre, who, who basically was the guy who was responsible for the reign of terror, he cited Rousseau's writing. It was very influential for him. And he sent thousands of people to the guillotine for, for you know, he sacrificed people at the altar of reason. So that's what I mean by enlightenment has a dark side, and we have to be aware of all these actors. Kant was definitely somebody that wrote a lot on, the, on, the, on reason, and he really, you know, like, mauled over the issue of reason. But his ideas, if you really get down into it, influences others. Like, it's not, a, you know, this whole thing is, is a historical construction, right? So the, mm -hmm. the lines are not distinct. They're very, they're, they're arbitrary, and while some aspects of their work can be seen as supporting Enlightenment values, others cannot, are not. So someone like Locke, there's no argument he's an Enlightenment thinker. I, I don't think his ideas are, could ever, you know, be said to have influenced postmodernism, or there's some that are a bit more clear-cut, but Kant is one of those, and so is, um, uh, and in the, at the end, I think Kant lost the argument to David Hume. Mm. David Hume was right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Sean.